Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Canadian Music Week for inviting Strategy to work and sponsor uh, today's events, and also to give me, in giving me the privilege uh, to introduce today's keynote speaker, Guy Kawasaki. Um, Guy's business philosophy is one that I can really relate to, and I believe it's a surefire plan for success. Like Apple in the early years, the company I work for, Brunico Communications, was an upstart company a decade ago, only in publishing. Uh, our speaker today has had years of experience as a business strategist and a leader in uh, high technology. Kawasaki's success at Apple was the result of his innovative approach to sales, marketing, and management. Guy is also the author of numerous publications, including Selling the Dream and How to Drive Your Competition Crazy. He is also a monthly columnist for Forbes. Today we have the benefit of hearing Guy's presentation, which is a Take No Prisoner's Guide for Davids to Beat Goliaths. I'm sure his presentation will enlighten us and help us think in more imaginative and productive ways. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Guy Kawasaki. Thank you. Uh, thank, you for, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I am here to give you a talk about driving your competition crazy. Uh, and as, as uh, Shelley mentioned, I work for Apple today. Uh, so some of you may be wondering how someone from Apple could possibly have the chutzpah to speak uh, <laughs> publicly because of all the news about Apple. Uh, and the answer to that question is that uh, I was booked nine months ago. Uh, <laughs> how, many of, how many of you use Macintoshes in this room? And how many of you use Windows? <coughs> so this is a fairly enlightened audience. Uh, most audiences I speak to are either all Mac or all Windows. I very seldom get a nice even mix like this. For the benefit of the people who use Macintoshes in this room, let me tell you a true story about a Windows user so you can understand your colleagues. Um, <laughs> This, this Windows user had bought a computer from Novell and called Novell for technical support, specifically to find out about the warranty period on his Windows machine. And he got on the phone, and he was talking to the Novell tech support person about the length of the warranty. And uh, he said, well, you know, what, 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 what's wrong uh, with your computer that you're calling about the warranty period? And he said, well, the cup holder broke. And the tech support person said, well, there's no cup holder on a computer. He said, oh, of course there is. You press the button, and the little tray comes out, and you put your cup in it. <laughs> so now you know what kind of people use Windows machines. Uh, I've got two cup holders. <laughs> you have an external cup holder and an internal cup holder. There's a new 10 times cup holder. Um, of course, in the Windows world, it's much harder to install the cup holder. So there are fewer cup holders out there. Uh, a little bit of my background. I worked for the first time at Apple from 1983 to 1987. I was Apple's software evangelist. It was my job to make sure that people wrote software for Macintosh. This is before it really shipped. Uh, I worked in the Mac division. This Mac division was led by Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple Computer. And uh, that was quite an experience. The Macintosh division was basically the biggest collection of eagle maniacs in the history of Silicon Valley. Um, I say that with a great deal of pride, actually. Uh, there was a, at the time, Apple Computer was organized by product. So there was the Apple II division, and the Macintosh division, and the Lisa division, and the peripherals division. And the joke inside of Apple about the rest of us, i.e. the Macintosh division, was how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer to that question is one, because the Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around him. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the Microsoft version of this joke is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer to that is none, because Bill Gates simply declares darkness the new standard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, working for the, the co-founder of a company has advantages. Uh, we were specially treated in this division. We had unlimited supplies of fresh orange juice at $2 a bottle. 
On Thursdays and Fridays, we had massage therapists come into our building, so we got back rubs while we sat in our cubicles. <laughs> and for any flight over two hours, we could fly first class, unlike any other part of Apple Computer. Um, I interpreted the two hours to begin from the moment I left my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and I basically flew first class everywhere. Uh, you know, a lot has been written about the Macintosh division and analyzed about the Macintosh division. You know, and the question keeps coming back to what were we trying to do? And, and I'll tell you that the answer to that question, at least from a public statement, was that we were trying to increase people's creativity and productivity. That's what the Macintosh division stands for. That's what Apple Computer to this day stands for. Uh, of course, there was a, another agenda for most of us. Uh, this was in 83. We were all you know, in our 20s and 30s back then. And uh, we wanted to make history. We wanted to do in IBM, really. That's what the Macintosh division wanted to do. I mean, we had to say we're into creativity and productivity. But fundamentally, what we were trying to do is drive IBM crazy. We wanted to send IBM back to the typewriter business holding its electric balls. <laughs> so, it's an American phrase. Um, so I've, in my career, I have competed with IBM. I've competed with Ashton Tate, which is a very large, was a very large database company. And now I'm back at Apple competing with Microsoft. So I have learned a lot about driving one's competition crazy. And this speech is about how to drive your competition crazy, reflecting my experiences at Apple, as well as starting uh, a couple of software companies and uh, doing a lot of research about how other companies have driven their competition crazy. And I would like to pass this knowledge on to you so that you can use it in your industry, whether you are a radio station or a talent agent or a TV station or a publication. Um, this is the kind of thing you need to do to drive your competition crazy. So take what I've learned. Sometimes I did it right. Sometimes I did it wrong. But in all cases, I learned a lot. So this is the best way I can figure out to drive your competition crazy. I'm going to give you 10 steps to drive your competition crazy. I found that this 10 step top 10 format works very well because it allows the audience to track my progress through my speech. <laughs> that way, if, you, you know, if you're finding me boring on number four, you know you have to endure six more. Okay? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to give you 11, so you're going to have to deal with seven more. So. Uh, the first thing you need to do to drive your competition crazy is to know yourself. And many organizations try to drive their competition crazy before they know themselves. And when you do that, inevitably what happens is you drive yourself crazy as opposed to your competition. What I mean by knowing yourself is you need to understand why customers are using your services or using your products. Not the features. In Apple's case, for example, we don't say that we have a PowerPC chip, we have a disk drive, a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse. You have $2,000. You give me the $2,000, and I'll give you the silicon and the glass and the metal. That's not our approach at all. Apple Computer is in the business of increasing your creativity and productivity. So you have to figure out what business you're in. What benefits do you provide to your customers, to your listeners? Okay, um, let's take another example, Federal Express. Federal Express is not in the business of airplanes and vans and delivery people. Okay, Federal Express is in the business of peace of mind. That's what they sell. Honda. Honda is a very interesting company. It started by sending three people to live in the United States. Uh, this is in the late 50s. These three people lived in Los Angeles. They bought one car. So the other two people needed a way to get around. So they brought with them from Japan something called the Honda Super Cub, which is basically a bicycle with an engine on it. The two people were tooling around Los Angeles a lot. And many people asked them, where'd you get this bicycle with an engine on it? And because of that completely informal, impromptu market research, they figured out that maybe the first thing they should try to bring to America is a bicycle with an engine on it, the Super Cub. 
The Super Cup evolved to a line of motorcycles. The line of motorcycles evolved to the first Honda car. The first Honda car was an N600, basically two bicycles with an engine between it. <laughs> the N600 became Civic, Civic the Accord, the Accord led to the Acura line of cars, the Integra, the Legend, the NSX. The interesting thing about Honda is, you know, when you ask yourself, what business is Honda in? Are they in the economy car business? Are they in the mid-level car business? Are they in the luxury car business? Are they in the sports car business? Are they in the lawnmower business? Or are they in the generator business? The answer to that question is Honda is in the business of making great engines. And sometimes those engines are connected to four wheels and a blade, a lawnmower. Sometimes four wheels in an economy car. Sometimes four wheels in a sports car. But the reason that Honda exists is for the engine. They make great engines. They transform energy. That's what Honda does. And Federal, is, Federal Express is peace of mind. And Apple is creativity and productivity. You have to figure out what you stand for. Not your building, not your services, not the physical attributes of your product. You have to stand, you have to figure out what you stand for. Be it entertainment, be it independence, be it efficacy, be it power, whatever it is. Peace of mind like Federal Express. Figure out what you stand for. That's the first step. The second step is to know your customer. Everybody writes about knowing your customer. Let me give you a slightly different take on it. Most people say, OK, I'm going to know my customer. I'm going to get a market research firm to come in and do research on my customer. They're going to do a statistical analysis, focus groups, surveys, all that kind of stuff. Or they say, well, let's have the marketing research department within our sales department, within our marketing department, do some research and send it on back to us so that the executives can read about the customer. And I believe both methods are completely wrong that knowing your customer is a very analog business. It is blocking and tackling. It is about pressing flesh. The Japanese have a saying that the more important something is, the more you should rely on amateurs. Okay? So in other words, if it's very important to know what your customers want, you yourself as the manager should go out and ask them. Do not use the marketing research professional, because a professional will will summarize the information in statistical ways, in, in ways that they are used to, in ways that are standard for the business. And you will get surveys, and you will get cold filtered information. Okay? What you need is to press flesh. When Japanese consumer companies want to know how people buy products in American TV and hi-fi and computer stores, they don't commission a study. They get on a plane and they sit in CompUSA or they sit in Fry's and they watch how people buy their products. They're amateurs as researchers, but they're professionals in their companies. One company that really has done this well is Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson has institutionalized pressing flesh. If you work for Harley Davidson, it is required that you go out to a Harley Davidson biker rally every year. Whether you're secretary, vice president, president, manager, or director, everybody goes to a Harley Davidson biker rally. You know? And that has enormous ramifications. Because if you just took research done by professionals about Harley Davidson owners, you would lose a lot of the translation. You, know, you would lose the fact that Harley Davidson owners are not gang members anymore. They are not mechanics. They are yuppies. Okay? And, and the receptionist needs to know, when he or she answers the phone, that you are talking to a yuppie, not a gang member. Okay? <laughs> it, has, it has tremendous changes when you press flesh. Second example, many companies raise the fence between themselves and their customers. What they're trying to do is avoid customer contact, because customer contact is allegedly expensive. My company could be accused of this in the past. What you try to do is you hide where your headquarters is. Okay? So they can't figure out where your headquarters is. First, they have to figure out which city you're from. Then they have to figure out the area code of that city. Then they have to call information and get the phone number of your company. And then, if they do all that, they get put in voicemail hell. Okay? By contrast, is that what your company does? <laughs> by, by, by contrast, there's General Electric appliances. If you buy a GE toaster and turn it over, 
there's a little label that says questions or comments, call this 800 number 24 hours a day. That's how you get information from them and that's how you give information to them. There is no fence between you and General Electric Appliance. No figuring out where they are, no figuring out a phone number, no voicemail help. Lower the fence. The final approach is to use a scientific approach. And the best example I have found of this is a ski resort called North Star Lake Tahoe. They, North Star Lake Tahoe has a frequent skiers program, like airlines have frequent flyer programs. Now, an airline keeps track of how many miles you fly, okay, from Toronto to San Francisco. That's pretty standard. It really doesn't change, okay? However, North Star Lake Tahoe wants to track how many vertical feet you ski. So the more vertical feet you ski, the better the deal, the better the reward. Now if you think about it, how does one track vertical feet? It depends what time you got to the mountain. It depends how long the lift lines were. It depends how long you took for lunch. It depends what time you left the mountain. It depends on which lifts you went up and down. Lots of variables. So what North Star has done is they've created a bracelet. And in that bracelet is a chip. So when you ski through the lift line, you hold your bracelet up to a sensor. The sensor records who you are and which lift line you're in. Because it knows which lift you're in, it knows how many feet you're going to ski down. It takes that information and creates marketing programs, you know, midweek incentives to ski on the mountain. It also has complete knowledge of the customer. It knows who the person is, what time of day, and which lift the person has gone up and down during the day. And I think that is an amazing amount of knowledge about a customer. So those are three examples of pressing flesh, knowing the customer. The third thing you need to do is to know your enemy. It's getting easier and easier to know your enemy, mostly because everybody has a website these days. And if anything, people put too much information on their websites. So the first thing you ought to do to know your enemy is go to their website. Second thing you ought to do is become their customer. Listen to your competitive radio stations. You know, listen to what they do. See what it's like to be their customer. I have to use Windows. Okay? I have to use Windows because I need to know, frankly, how much people will tolerate in an operating system. <laughs> <laughs> you can also become a shareholder. If you're competing with a publicly traded company, you should buy one share of their stock. And then they have to send you quarterly and annual reports. And I guarantee you, if you buy one share of stock and they're sending you quarterly and annual reports, you are not only getting information about them, they are losing money sending you all those reports. <laughs> and a third asset that is often untapped is research librarians. These people are underpaid. They're kept in these dark little rooms, but they have unlimited access to Knight Ritter information and Lexus and Nexus and the internet, you'll be absolutely stunned at the amount of information a good research librarian, even one that's working in a library, a public library for free, can find out for you. Now I have a caveat about knowing your enemy. There are two kinds of enemies. There are strategic enemies and tactical enemies. A tactical enemy is an enemy you fight in a zero-sum game. You know, if they get the ad, you don't get the ad. You know? If they buy Windows, they don't buy Macintosh. But there is a more important enemy, usually, called a strategic enemy. And this strategic enemy is often something much vaguer. It, it's often something that people share among tactical enemies. In the computer business, all of the computer manufacturers spend hundreds of millions of dollars bashing each other on the head, trying to create a slightly bigger slice of the pie for themselves. If we would all get together and defeat the strategic enemy that our industry shares, i.e., ignorance of what a personal computer can do, we would create a much larger pie and everyone would benefit. So be careful. Think of the both tactical and strategic enemies. You know, in, in your business, the internet is a very interesting challenge to your industry. One could make the case that it, it could be used for the delivery of music. Okay, it might compete with some of you. One could also make the case that it allows people to sample music, so it will help you. In the book business, Amazon.com is rewriting how books are sold. You know, and, and the interesting thing is, is Amazon.com the enemy or ally of booksellers? It's, very, it's, it's, it's not a simple question. I would make the case that the way the bookselling business evolved was this. First, there was the mom and pop store. 
you know, the owner proprietor read every book. You went in there and they recommended which novel for you to read. Okay? Those people basically were kind of put out of business by the strip malls, the Daltons, the, the Waldens of the world, right? <laughs> they didn't have much more of a selection, but they had stores everywhere. And you came in there and it's 25% off the New York Times bestseller. Okay? Those people were put out of business by the superstores, the Barnes and Nobles, the Borders. They had much larger selections and a place to sit down and drink coffee. Okay? Now, these kind of people are threatened by Amazon.com. Because at Amazon.com, you go to their website, and you put in a last name or a, a title, and you can search through a million possibilities. The largest bookstore, and you have the largest bookstore here in Toronto. It used to be a bowling alley, but now it's a bookstore. I think that bookstore has about 400,000 titles. Okay? Amazon.com has a million, and they mail it to you. You don't even have to leave your desk, and they give you 10% off. Okay, so maybe that's the competition of a bookstore. But then, if you think one more time, maybe Amazon.com will help the mom and pop store. Because when you're shopping for a book, there are, I found, two modes. One is the very specific book that you want. Somebody said you ought to buy this book, and it's two or three years old. So the odds of the mom and pop store having that book, zero. The odds of a Walden having that, that book is you know, one out of 100. The odds of e even a superstore, a Borders having that book, is two out of 100. The odds of Amazon.com having that book is 98 out of 100. On the other hand, there may be times where you want to browse, where you really want to ask the proprietor what kind of book to own. So I could make the case that Amazon.com will relieve the pressure from the mom and pops to do special orders where they lose money on each order for these old books that are basically hard to find. But it'll help people come back in for browsing. Amazon.com may be the best thing that ever happened to the mom and pop store because it takes the pressure off trying to compete on sheer number of titles in a bookstore. So Amazon.com is a very interesting case for whether it is competition or an ally for bookstores. The fourth thing you need to do to drive your competition crazy is to take this, this basis, this knowing of yourself and your customer and your competition, and then focus not on your competition but on your customer. Because the best way to drive your competition crazy is not for you to do something to the competition. It is for you to do things for the customer. The best way to drive your competition crazy is to succeed. And the only way to succeed is to focus on your customer, not the competition. How many of you have children in this audience? OK, so most high-tech audiences, people don't have kids. They don't have sex, frankly. <laughs> of course, if you saw most high-tech audiences, you'd understand why they don't have sex. <laughs> so the phrase, uh, vacationing with children, is an oxymoron, <laughs> much like Apple marketing or Microsoft innovation. <laughs> now, this oxymoron of vacationing with children, when you travel with children and you, know, you stay at a Crown Plaza or a Hyatt or a Westin or a Four Seasons or a Ritz-Carlton, you know, the kind of hotels that this audience would stay in, one of the things you notice about traveling with children is they generate a lot of laundry. And laundry in a hotel is very expensive. Okay? So, there's that one aspect of expense, you know, $5 for booties. The second issue is logistics. You send laundry out at 9 in the morning, and you hopefully get it back at 6 p.m. <coughs> My son has one blankie. If he doesn't have that particular blankie, he won't take a nap. Okay? If he won't take a nap, why go on vacation? All right? <laughs> so this means it's very tricky to send out his blankie. It's a unique blankie out through a laundry system. It's very dangerous. It could come back late or not at all. And it not at all would be a real problem on a vacation. So all of this is because I want to tell you about a hotel in Kauai named the Kauai Hyatt Regency. The Kauai Hyatt Regency focuses on its customer. It has laundry rooms. Those laundry rooms mean that there are less guest rooms. It also means that people send out less laundry through the hotel laundry system. Both things reduce revenue. And then if you go in the laundry room, you would see that the washers and the dryers are free. And that, to me, is amazing that in Kauai, at a Hyatt, 
You don't even have to put the quarters in the washer and the dryer. Somebody really made a decision to focus on the customer. And that's why I go all over the world telling people to stay at the Kauai Hard Regency. Dining with toddlers or children is also an oxymoron. You have two choices. You can eat in half an hour, or you can eat at McDonald's because they have the slide with the rubber balls in it. Those rubber balls provide two things, entertainment as well as inoculation from various childhood diseases. <laughs> In Portland, Oregon, there is a restaurant called Old Wives' Tales. And in that restaurant, there is a 150 square foot area where there are wooden sailboats and a wooden locomotive. The way you eat with kids at Old Wives' Tales is you take your kids in there, you sit down, you order, you dump your kids in the play area. When the food comes, you drag them back, you stuff them, you dump them back in the play area. Okay? You can take an hour to eat dinner at Old Wives' Tales with kids. That's twice as long as any other restaurant in the world. Okay? That children's play area represents cannibalization of revenue. There are less tables at the restaurant. And it also means that inventory turns slower at the restaurant because people with kids who would rush out in half an hour because their kids are driving them nuts, now they can stay for an hour. So there's less turn in the restaurant. However, people will drive from all over Portland to stay at that, re to eat at that restaurant because that's the place you can eat with with kids. I'm going to tell you a story that has nothing to do with this speech. Um, it's just the evolution of a market. My wife and I, as I said, have two children. And um, before child number one was born, about three months before when we were pregnant, you have to say we, okay? I don't know about in Canada, but in America, you have to say we are pregnant. Of course, we didn't need the epidural, but <laughs> it's a different discussion. <laughs> so when we were pregnant, roughly three months before it was born, the uh, nesting hormone kicks in. And one of the consequences of the nesting hormone is you have to make big decisions. The biggest decision is probably diapers. <laughs> now, for child one, being a California couple who's trying to be politically and environmentally correct, you say to yourself, I'm not going to leave the earth covered with disposable diapers that take 50,000 years to decompose. <laughs> We're going to do cotton diapers. We're going to wash these cotton diapers with biodegradable hypoallergenic soap ourselves. <laughs> this is baby one. Okay. Baby two is simple green and Clorox, but baby one is <laughs> hypoallergenic biodegradable soap. So baby one is born, and about two weeks into the, this process, not of, of labor, but two weeks after born, uh, you start noticing these things about cotton diapers. One is. You don't really want to wash its diapers with your stuff. <laughs> Number two is that sets off another environmental crisis because on the one hand, you have to wait for critical mass <laughs> because you don't, you don't want to wash small loads because then you feel guilty about wasting water. On the other hand, you don't want to have this thing hanging around waiting for critical mass. <laughs> so after three weeks, you decide you're going to use cotton diaper service. Cotton diaper service is going to bring you cotton diapers. Three weeks of that go by, and you notice problems with that, which is sometimes you forget to put the critical mass out for pickup. Sometimes they fail to deliver diapers. So basically, after six weeks, we went from, let's do cotton diapers ourselves with biodegradable hypoallergenic soap, to let's use a cotton diaper service, to let's just use Pampers and give money to the Sierra Club. <laughs> So, I'll tell you one more story about focusing on the customer. This is kind of from your industry. Uh, there was a city where there were three TV stations that competed in a zero-sum game, tactical battle. So one TV station started running a lottery every day. So the second TV station started running a lottery at the same time. And the two TV stations started competing. Who would give away more money, figuring that whoever gave away more money would draw more uh, listenership um, or viewership, as the case may be. And then the really clever TV station must have had owners from Canada. The third TV station started running the winning numbers from the other two TV stations and not giving away any money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the TV station that focused on the customer. The fifth thing to do to drive your competition crazy is to create a cause, not just a company. 
It's to create something, a phenomena about your organization. Um, I think the closest thing that I'm familiar with in your industry is Wyndham Hill. Wyndham Hill had evangelists. Apple Computer has evangelists. You know, you used to go, you used to be able to go into a record store, and you didn't ask for Tuck and Patty or George Winston. You asked for the Wyndham Hill section, and people would be calling radio stations saying, "Run some Wyndham Hill music," and they would go into record stores saying, "Where's your Wyndham Hill section?" Okay, those are evangelists. That's what Apple has. Apple's around because we have raging, inexorable, thunder lizard evangelists who are not stockholders and not employees. What an evangelist is trying to do is they're trying to help their friends have a wonderful experience. It's nothing to do with money. Okay, people who evangelize you on Macintosh, they want you to use the right personal computer. It's not because they're going to make a buck off of it. What you want to do is make yourself into that kind of cause that you represent this empowerment or enjoyment or something like that so that word of mouth is generated by your customers. They will be your unpaid sales force. To do this, here are some steps. The first thing, if you want to find evangelists, is you need to figure out who the right people are. This is a mistake that Apple made. We went through this brain dead MBA yuppie yellow tie analysis that we should evangelize Presidents, vice presidents, and MIS directors of Fortune 500 companies. Because they had the title, they had the power, they would bring Macintoshes into Fortune 500 companies. Okay? That sold three Macintoshes. Basically, the people who made Macintosh successful were the salt of the earth, the publishers, the graphic designers, the artists, the secretaries, the administrative aides, the students. It was everybody except people with titles. Okay? The lesson there is the right people are the people who get it, and will help you. It has nothing to do with titles. Second thing is, somehow let people test drive your product. Let them experience your product. Whether it's downloading a clip from the internet, whether it's a trial piece of software, whether it's a sample edition, let people somehow test drive your product. You are saying to them, I think you are smart. And because I think you are smart, I'm not going to bludgeon you into becoming my customer. Instead, I'm going to give you the information and let you conclude for yourself. The third thing you do is provide an easy, safe first step. That is, you don't force them into a very risky proposition to become your evangelist, to become your customer. The position here is you don't tell people to throw out all the PCs and put in Macintoshes. You tell them, let us just do your web pages, or let us just do your publishing, or let us just do your digital imaging. It's very different from telling a company to throw out all their old machines. And the fourth thing is, let a thousand flowers bloom. And by that I mean be open to weird ideas that might make your company. Okay? The example that I can use is Apple Computer. Apple Computer is around today because of desktop publishing. Let me tell you how desktop publishing started. Paul Brainerd showed up at Apple one day with a prototype of a product called PageMaker. He had an appointment not with me, not with Steve Jobs, not with John Scully. He had an appointment with the product manager for the Apple Laser Writer Printer. This is in 1984. Apple Laser Writer Printer was $7,000. Okay? You can buy a better printer today for $500. The interesting thing about this meeting was that the printer guy loved PageMaker because he saw the first thing that justified spending $7,000 on a printer. Well, I have to tell you that no one at Apple Computer foresaw desktop publishing. It wasn't our vision. We didn't plan it. John Scully or Steve Jobs didn't say to me, guy, go out and evangelize the electronic composition of pages. That just, that was a gift from God. Okay? <laughs> if you doubt the existence of God, you ought to rethink your position on the existence of God because Apple Computer's continued survival is proof there is a benevolent God. Okay? <laughs> now, getting off the theological bandstand here, the message here is that, you know, in 1984, we thought we had it all figured out. We wanted a spreadsheet from Lotus. We wanted a database from Ashton Tate. We wanted a word, per, word processor from WordPerfect. That's what we needed. Instead, it was PageMaker that saved Apple Computer, a product we never foresaw. Desktop publishing, we never foresaw. That was a field of flowers that grew into a forest that saved our butts. It wasn't planned. So when people come up to you with weird ideas, 
for your company, for your label, for your radio station, you ought to listen to them because one of those weird ideas might be your page maker, might be your desktop publishing. And now I'm going to read to you from a commercial or an ad for something very analog to just to challenge you. This is for two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber. A woman is often measured by the things she cannot control. She is measured by the way her body curves or doesn't curve by where she is flat or straight or round. She is measured by 36, 24, 36, and inches and ages and numbers, by all the outside things that don't ever add up to who she is on the inside. So if a woman is to be measured, let her be measured by the things she can control, by who she is and who she is trying to become. Because as every woman knows, measurements are only statistics, and statistics lie. Okay, That's for two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber called Nike women's aerobic shoes. Okay. Nike does not say to you, you have $150. We have two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber made in Taiwan. <laughs> you give me the $150, I will give you the two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber made in Taiwan. <laughs> Nike has made women's aerobic shoes into a cause with evangelists. It stands for efficacy and power and independence. It's not two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber. So if it can be done for two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber, imagine what you should be able to do for your products and services. The sixth way to drive your competition crazy is to focus on the truly decisive points. I think I can show all, all of you all you need to know about marketing in the next five minutes. Make yourself a graph. On the vertical axis is your company's unique ability to provide something. On the horizontal axis is the value of that something to the customer. So if you're high on the graph, it means only you can provide it. If you're far off to the right, it means that thing is very valuable. All of marketing boils down to how do you get high and to the right? How is it so that you are uniquely able to provide something of great value to the customer? Okay? If you're uniquely able to provide something of no value to a customer, you're a bozo. On the other hand, if you're able to provide something of great value to the customer, but not uniquely, you're sheep. You're going to compete on price. The issue is, how do you get high and to the right? Where Apple Computer is high and to the right in digital content creation, you know, music, video, print, internet content, multimedia, we print money in those areas. Where we're low and to the left, we get our clocks clean. Okay? All of marketing boils down to how do you get high and to the right on that graph. The seventh way to drive your competition crazy is to resist the known and defend the unknown. It's to embrace the next curve. It's to cause the next curve. There used to be an ice harvesting industry in New England. This meant that every winter, Bubba and Junior would go out to a frozen lake or pond, cut blocks of ice, then ship these blocks of ice all over the world. Bubba and Junior's idea of R&D was how do we get a sharper saw? The ice harvesters, they were put out of business by the ice factories. The ice factories, they froze water any city, any time of the year. The ice factories' idea of R&D was how do we freeze water faster. They were put out of business by the refrigerator companies, personal chillers, if you will. Okay? So the interesting thing is no ice harvester jumped the curve and became an ice factory. And no ice factory jumped the curve and became a refrigerator company. Everybody duped it out on the curve they were on and died on the curve. You want to drive your competition crazy? Jump to the next curve. Create the next curve. The eighth way to drive your competition crazy is to seize the day, or better still, create your own day. A few years ago, Bank of America bought Security Pacific. It closed many Security Pacific branches down. First Interstate, upon finding out which branches were being closed down, drove vans into the parking lots and recruited customers as they were walking out of Security Pacific. Totally seizing the day. Creating your own day, Levi Strauss commissioned a study of the impact of casual dress on morale and productivity. The results were positive. It made the results available to the press. 3,000 stories appeared. They put in an 800 number so you could call to get a casual dress kit, how to implement casual dress standards in companies. They will also do a fashion show for you at your company site. Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss created the day. 
They commissioned that study. If that study had come back negative, they would have thrown that study away. Okay, it was their study to do with what they wanted. Create your own day. Fund the study. Do those kinds of things. It comes out negative, throw it away. We're talking about evangelism here, not science. Okay? Create your own day. It's not a coincidence that Levi Strauss makes dockers. They created their own day. The ninth way to drive your competition crazy is to make good by doing good. It's to align with social causes. Home Depot, for example, sells building materials and tools. They have an alliance with Habitat for Humanity, an organization that builds homes for poor people. Perfect alliance. Apple Computer used to have a promotion with Safeway, it's these stores in America, where kids would save Safeway receipts, take them to their schools, their schools would bring them to Apple, and Apple would give them equipment. Apple was trying to get equipment into the hands of young people so that they could develop discriminating taste in operating system. Okay? Schools were getting equipment they could not afford to buy. Safeway, were getting, Safeway was getting these junior evangelists who would go out and want Safeway receipts. They'd go to their parents and say, you know, we need to shop at Safeway because we need Safeway receipts. Imagine the worst case if you were the manager of a market that competed with Safeway and your kids come home from school one day and say, we don't want your receipts. We want Safeway receipts. Sometimes you can align with social causes, make good, and do good. The tenth way is to destroy your competition, get rid of your competition, cease competition by converting your competition to co-opetition. It is to work with the people you used to compete with. After the Civil War, Abe Lincoln worked with the leaders of the South. Many of the leaders of the North accused him of working with the enemy. So Abe Lincoln responded by saying, am I not destroying our enemy by making them into our friend? The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway used to compete with J.B. Hunt Transport. One was a railroad company, another is a trucking company. It used to be a zero-sum game. People thought, you either send something by truck or you send something by railroad. Well, these two companies, former competitors, got together and they worked together. So now, you call one number and a J.B. Hunt Transport truck picks up your goods, takes it to a Santa Fe Railway. Santa Fe Railway takes the entire truck to a distant city. There the truck gets off the railroad and drives the final distance. Customer gets one-stop shopping for truck and railroad. Railroad gets business it would have lost a trucking company. Trucking company now is more profitable because its trucks don't break down nearly as often because most of the distance is covered on the back of a railroad car, not driving on a highway. That's an example. A good alliance. A good alliance means that customers benefit, not just PR departments. A good alliance means that people at the lower and middle levels of the company work together, not just the presidents who are trying to announce this strategic alliance. Now, if you do these 10 things, if you understand yourself and your competition and the customer, if you're focusing on the customer, you're creating a cause, you're positioning yourself high and to the right, you're making good by doing good, you're jumping or creating curves, you're seizing the day or creating your own day. If you do all that, then the 11th way to drive your competition crazy is to purposely play with their minds. <laughs> so let me give you some classic examples. When a pizza company entered the Denver market for the first time, it ran a promotion. The promotion was, tear out the Yellow Pages ad of our competition and bring it in with your order and we'll give you two pizzas for the price of one. <laughs> that is brilliant. Very brilliant. When I was president of the company that competed with Ashton Tate, I discovered that the Ashton Tate employee who managed the product that competed with ours was in our database, i.e. he had bought our product to make sure that he knew his competition. So I sent him a mug with a letter that said, Dear customer, thank you very much for your support. Things are going so well that we've decided to give a mug to every one of our customers. But I only sent it to him. <laughs> <laughs> There was an electrician in Chicago who was constantly razzed by his friends and his competition that he only had one truck. He wasn't a fleet. He didn't have a whole bunch of trucks. So one day, he went and he painted one serial number on the left side of the truck, another serial number on the right side, and another number on the rear. Pretty soon, everybody thought he had a fleet. Nobody ever thought to go to the truck and check all three sides <laughs> to make sure that the numbers were different. 
International Harvester is in the tractor business. To make tractors, you need steel. To get steel, you need trucks. To get trucks, you need drivers. To get drivers, you need a union. Once International Harvester's union went on strike, they tried to use non-union labor, but there were snipers on the freeway shooting at people driving trucks who were not in the truck driver's union. So in order to get steel, it went to local schools, rented the buses, dressed up as drivers as nuns, and delivered steel to the plant that way, figuring that not even a union would shoot at a, shoot at a nun driving a school bus. For the conclusion of this presentation, please turn the cassette over and depress the play button. It was an independent store. It was in the community for years. I mean, you know the type. You know, smaller store, great service. You know the proprietor. Right next to it opened up a superstore. You also know the type. Huge selection, lower prices, competes on volume, OK? So this poor entrepreneur, this proprietor who had been there for years, he didn't know what to do. What was he going to do to compete with this superstore? And then he did something very clever. He went and he renamed his store Main Entrance. <laughs> now I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> we could call our computers the Windows Macintosh and everybody would buy it. Um, I'm going to talk to you about winning because I think this is the a room of winners. In the purest form, winning becomes a means. It's not an end. It is a means to improve yourself and your competition. In order to improve the world, people and companies like you have a moral obligation to play to win and to force everyone to play at the absolute highest level. Winning is also a means to play again. The rewards of winning, the money, the power, the satisfaction, the confidence, should never be squirreled away. The unexamined life may not be worth living, but the unlived life is not worth examining. And so here you have 10 ways to drive your competition crazy, plus you have the 11th way of playing with their minds. And I hope that you can apply these to make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.